Now that is a giant Idaho morel mushroom. How are my Photoshop skills? I wish they were that big. <laughs> it's so funny making that picture. Some people believe that's a morel mushroom. They say, is that real? Yes, in my mind's eye, sure. So when we're out giving presentations to the public, uh, we always enter into a kind of an agreement with the audience. I do belong to the North Idaho Mushroom Club. We've been around since the 1960s. We have about 100 members. I've been with the club about 30 years. I'm one of the club's educators, and I'm an amateur mycologist. I'm not a professional. I'll get that out right away. But this is a pretty serious hobby for me, and I've been enjoying it a long time. But when we meet with uh, groups out in the community, part of this agreement is that you agree that you're not gonna use the information exclusively from this presentation to go out and pick mushrooms from the table, uh, for your table. We want you to have um, experience, some field guides, join our club, and be really confident before you do that. So worst case scenario is this spring, somebody goes out into the forest, they pick a mushroom, they say, that looks a lot like one of the pictures Tim showed in his program. He said it was edible. It looks, a, I think it looks, I think, yeah, I think that's what it'll look like. And then you bring it home and eat it. So we would ask that you not do that. So we're in agreement, yes? yes. So I'm looking at the uh, exits. We're good, okay, great. Ah. How are my Photoshop skills now? <laughs> so this is Paul Bunyan, great state of Maine. He walked quickly to the state of Idaho and found one of those giant morel mushrooms. Look at the expression on his face. That's the expression I have on my face. So we've seen an increase in uh, interest in mushrooming across the country. It's really picking up. People are foraging a lot in the forests. Mushrooming in particular, and here in the Inland Northwest, we've seen it as well. So we give workshops frequently. Uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we would be fortunate to have 10 or 12 people show up, which was great. We loved that interaction. But for some reason, lately, we have had standing room only every time we're out in the community. They, I've, we've actually had people turned away at the door because of fire code capacity. So something's going on here, and we think that's great. Um, something that happens at these presentations, we have people bring, on, bring in a lot of mushrooms, which we enjoy too. We can spend some time identifying those. But almost inevitably, at every single one of these events, somebody approaches me like this, mushroom in hand, and they're not asking me whether or not I can help them identify the mushroom. They always ask the same question. Can I eat this mushroom? And I always have the exact same answer. Yes, you can eat any mushroom. <laughs> Once. <laughs> Once. Now, I know that's a joke, all joking aside. You know, I'm trying to have some serious undertones there as well. And that is, we, we don't want the public to just focus on, can I eat this mushroom? Can I eat this mushroom? You know, we need to have a knowledge base before we do that. So at our workshops and in our club, yes, we teach what the edibles are, but there are also some lookalikes out there. So these are mushrooms that show up around the same time that you're picking your edible mushroom, and pretty much to the untrained eye, these lookalikes might have a similar color, similar shape, and they trick people. So to the untrained eye, they may pick a look-alike, take that home for the table, and some of the look-alikes will get you in trouble or they're poisonous, so we don't want to go down that road. Um, but once you start learning edible mushrooms in a club environment, the learning curve goes fast. I mean, you become confident pretty quickly we also talk about the local mushrooms that will get you in trouble. So we have geographic variances around the United States and world. So we do have a couple of mushrooms here that can be deadly poisonous. 
So we talk about those as well. They've caused problems for people around the country. And we have a couple of rules in our club. Here's one of them. When in doubt, throw it out. Be 100% sure of your identification if you're going to bring something home for the table. So we have a uh, Facebook page. We're really fortunate. It's the North Idaho Mushroom Club Facebook page. We have about 4,000 followers now. So we engage the public quite a bit. They post a lot of photos of mushrooms and they're looking for help for identification. But do you know what the question they usually ask? Can I eat this mushroom? So we would never positively identify a mushroom by photo alone. I mean, that just makes sense, common sense. Um, a lot of times those photos aren't clear and people aren't trained in taking uh, photos that are needed for identification. We just don't want to go down that road. But if people are thinking about um, eating mushrooms, we have a couple of rules there too, especially a new species they've just collected. So imagine that you're with our club, you've learned to identify an edible, you know what the lookalike is or the lookalikes. We head into the forest with our baskets in hand. Men, you can do this. Ladies, you can do this. We find the edible mushroom, we fill our basket with it, and we take it back home. I don't know if you've had this experience before, but eating uh, a species of mushroom from the forest you just picked for the very first time. And a little bit of what we call mycophobia kicks in. And myco meaning fungi, phobia, the fear of fungi. So we suggest that you eat a little bit of the mushroom to start with and keep some aside. So if there's any problems, you just take what you put aside to urgent care with you and we'd, we'd go from there. It's true. So, you know, people have allergies to mushrooms just like any other food. So sometimes people have a reaction and they confuse that with poisoning. And, you know, that's part of this, this fear, fear base. We also have people who engage in what I call overzealous collecting. So these are people new to mushrooming and they're highly excited by these edible mushrooms. We are too, but they're highly excited. And when we get out into the forest, we get into a good patch, like let's say fall chanterelles, they go bonkers. They go wildly running through the forest, picking everything they can get their hands on and not really taking time to look at what they're putting in their basket. Those of us who have some experience, we like to get down on the ground with our mushroom. We like to stare at the mushroom. We like to look around for other mushrooms. We like to enjoy the environment. I might even take my camera phone out and take a picture of the mushroom. I have photos of mushrooms in my wallet. <laughs> I'm a real fun guy. <laughs> it always works. It always works. Okay. So all joking aside, so that's what we recommend. We also recommend that people, um, you know, make sure, of course, they have fresh mushrooms that they're cooking. But don't try a brand new mushroom on kids or people who have medical conditions. So try it out a little bit yourself, see how you do, then test it on the kids. <laughs> so let's get this out of the way. <clears throat> Poisonous mushrooms. You may or may not know these facts, but um, between 1998 and 2016, there were 52 mushroom-related fatalities in the United States. So that's about two or three a year. You might have thought that was a lot more. Every fatality is a tragedy. Part of the mission of our club is to educate the public. We'd love to see that number get down to zero. But there is one genus of mushroom, a group of mushrooms, that's responsible for 90% of the fatalities in the world and that's the Amanita genus. And this is a primary culprit in that genus, the Amanita phylloides, also known as the death cap mushroom. So this mushroom grows quite a bit on the coast. We don't really have it in this area particularly. 
And in the San Francisco area, there's huge fruitings of this mushroom. That's where you know, some of the fatalities occur. It's terrestrial, it grows in parks, it grows in people's gardens, and it's moving, it's migrating. We found this mushroom on Vancouver Island, British Columbia, a couple of years ago, in a cause of fatality. And I'll be honest, I found this once in Hayden, Idaho, in some freshly laid out uh, wood chips. And it scared me. I, I couldn't believe I found this mushroom here because we don't have this mushroom here. So it is moving around. So it makes sense in our club that we spend a lot of time uh, and energy learning about that mushroom. So this is a photo, uh, turn of the century, of some women from Russia with baskets in hand heading into the forest to collect some mushrooms. The United States, Canada, United Kingdom, uh, there's a lot of mycophobia in those countries for whatever reason. Now, some fear of mushrooms is very healthy, but there's a high level of fear of mushrooms in those countries. If you were to go to any other country on the planet Earth, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Asia, doesn't matter. They've been collecting mushrooms for centuries. Children learn from their parents and grandparents. They did a survey um, in the country of Finland recently. This is a cool statistic. 48% of the people living in Finland listed mushrooming as their number one interest and hobby. Half of Finland is in the forest with baskets. <laughs> that, but that's pretty much indicative of all the other European countries too. If you've traveled, there is no fear of mushrooms in these countries. They've been picking mushrooms for centuries and centuries. So if we go right now, head to Europe and go to a farmer's market, you know, it would be filled with seasonal mushrooms. So they really enjoy that. So it's not really ingrained in our culture but I think we're starting to see foraging in the forest pick up. Well, this is my significant other, Svetlana. Svetlana's out there somewhere. Svetlana's a physician from Spokane. It's good to have a doctor with you when you're collecting <laughs> mushrooms. It's good to have Svetlana with me when I'm collecting mushrooms. So Svetlana grew up in the Soviet Union. She learned mushrooming from her parents and grandparents. Svetlana and I will walk a couple hundred miles a year mushrooming, you know, mostly in the fall and mostly in the spring. And we invite friends, relatives, uh, children. It's a giant Easter egg hunt for kids. It's a lot of fun. We're out in the forest. We may see wildlife. We're checking out new areas. And walking and foraging in the forest isn't this kind of thing where you're walking on a track, you're going over deadfall, you're going down ravines. It's a, a very athletic uh, uh, experience, lots of exercise, lots of fresh air. What Svetlana is holding here are morel mushrooms, actual size. These are actual size morel mushrooms. She's holding a blonde variety. We have both blacks and blondes here in North Idaho, Eastern Washington, and they're highly prized. Most people know what this mushroom is. They can be expensive too. If you get two, three, four of these dried, you know, at a store, they can cost 10, 12, 15 dollars. So people really enjoy this mushroom. We've waited all winter long, and here come the morels in the spring. So they start showing up late April through mid-May. We have a couple of sayings with morels. When the apple tree leaves are as big as squirrel's ears, morels are out. <laughs> we have a lot of fun at our mushroom club. <laughs> Lots of fun. When the lilacs are in bloom, morels are out. Mother's Day weekend, the largest fruiting around of morels, Morels are out. Mother's Day weekend. Morels are delicious. Uh, it's not your button mushroom that you get at the supermarket. It tastes just like a morel. <laughs> you have to experience it. 
what is this? It's a fungi. This is a mushroom as well. This is from the genus Ramaria. It's a coral mushroom. It looks just like the corals that grow under the sea. This is a brilliant lemon yellow coral. We have many different colors of corals, purples, reds, pinks. So we have to beat the deer to these mushrooms. The deer are hungry after a long winter and they can smell these mushrooms before they even come up out of the ground. So while we're picking morels, it's not unusual to see craters where deer have dug up you know, this mushroom. It's like candy to them. And so <clears throat> when this mushroom comes out uh, mid-May through June, we chop it up, throw it in that hot skillet. It releases a lot of water. We let that boil out and wait until the tips of the coral ends kind of turn a golden brown, salt, pepper, butter, deliciousness. It's a very mild mushroom. It can also have a laxative effect on some people. <laughs> That's why I don't eat them. But many people really love corals. Okay, jump to the fall. This is the golden chanterelle mushroom. Usually this is the other mushroom that people are really familiar with. It's a delectable edible. It's a culinary wonder. It's one of our favorite mushrooms. If you find this mushroom, GPS the spot because it has a tendency to grow in the same place year after year. When the fall rains come and it starts to get a little colder, these mushrooms start popping up. If you want to make sure the species that you're picking the right one, just GPS your coordinates to me. Um, <laughs> And I will double check for you every week until they come up. So these are pristine white, beautiful mushrooms when you cut these. Deer don't like them, insects don't like them. These are a lot of fun to find. This is probably the most popular mushroom on the planet Earth. You might not know this mushroom, but everywhere else in the world they love this mushroom. It's the King Belit, or Belitus edulis. So if we were to go to Italy, they call it the um, porcini, the sep, C-E-P. Germany, it's the steinpilz. England, it's the penny bun. Germany, it's the white mushroom. My daughter calls it the hamburger bun top mushroom. <laughs> so uh, this has a nutty, woodsy flavor to it, and it dries into chips really well. It's a gorgeous mushroom. Look at the enlarged base of the stem. And it doesn't have uh, gills under the cap, it has pores. So it, mushrooms are interesting. They can have gills or pores or teeth. This particular mushroom has pores, tubes, you know. Uh, so this is a really fun mushroom to find. This is a mushroom. This is from the genus Heresium. So it's called the bear's head or the bear's tooth. It can grow into giant 50-pound clusters of gorgeous white tiny icicles hanging off of dead wood. And we find it a lot on hemlock. It is one of my favorite mushrooms, not only to find and photograph, but to eat. It has a very delicate, mild, wonderful flavor to it. So you're starting to pick this up. These mushrooms look different. They have different textures. They have different tastes than the mushrooms we typically will you know, buy at the supermarket. Okay, this is the matsutake mushroom. This grows in North Idaho and Eastern Washington as well. It's probably the most expensive mushroom picture I've got up here, most expensive mushroom. This one specimen can go for 50, 75 bucks in an Asian market. So the commercial pickers We'll find this on our coastal regions, and they'll, they'll fight each other over this mushroom, unfortunately. But here in uh, North Idaho, Eastern Washington, our growing period is so short, we don't get commercial pickers over here. Svetlana and I collected quite a few of these this last fall, but we had a two-week window. When you see this mushroom, it's very kind of stout, rubbery feeling almost pristine white inside, and it smells like cinnamon, spicy. And so it's highly sought after, and we love this mushroom. So if you bring this into your car, your whole car is permeated with this spice smell. 
Finally, I'll leave you with this mushroom. This is a beautiful little mushroom that you might completely ignore while you're walking through the forest. It's blue-green color. You smell it before you see it. It smells like licorice. It's called the blue-green anise mushroom. So people will bring this home. They'll cut the caps off, chop those caps, and they add them to, get this, cookies and cakes. How cool is that? Or you can grind this into a powder for a kind of a licorice uh, candy powder. Finally, so Svetlana and I were cruising through the forest a couple years ago, and we saw a blonde morel there one spring. We thought, wow, two hours later, we picked 15 pounds of blonde morels. So here we are having fun. We've cleaned our morels. Uh, oh, we're drinking wine a little bit. <laughs> Skillets are going, butter, morels, so we're having a good time. So this is a very interesting hobby that's picking up in the United States. It's a healthy hobby. It's fun. Kids love it. Families love it. Communities are loving it. Our club is taking off. We've never seen this much interest before. So what I hope you do is this Mother's Day, grab mom, give her a basket, take her into the forest, and we'll meet you there on Mother's Day. And I'll tell you where one of our favorite morale spots are. You ready? Nah. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been a privilege and honor.